right. Well, good evening. Thank you for being here yet again for another study. A uh, proper title would be a contextual study on the hope of Israel, the resurrection of the dead. This is part 41. We've been at this almost, well, we've been at this more than a year now. So uh, let me just say thank you to those of you that are here live. God bless your souls. You, you folks are diligent. You're, uh, you, you know, you and I say that facetiously, but at the same time, uh, God bless your souls. Uh, but I mean, you know, I thank you. It's a genuine thank you for your time, your attention to this, your diligence, uh, your desire to understand and also to honor God through your understanding. So uh, there's many other things you could be doing with your Tuesday evenings. So uh, it says a lot to your, your diligence in the scriptures and your desire to honor the fellowship that you have uh, with us. So thank you. Thank you to each of you that are live here. Uh, those of you that are online, thank you again for you know your time and your diligence. If you've been following along and tracking with this study, again, God bless your soul. You know that that's amazing, and uh, it, you know I hope that this has proven to be a time to build up your understanding, uh, not answer every question because once you have every question answered, life just gets boring. Uh, so I hope that it's provoked more questions and it's provoked further desire to learn more. Uh, maybe go through other resources that we've uh, provided and we've mentioned and people that are writing more books and study resources and uh, videos and everything else. Please lean in on them all the more. And uh, I don't know that we'll ever find a time where we'll say we've got it all figured out. And if you do find yourself there, repent and come back to the right way uh, where we're still working at figuring all things out. So uh, thank you again for being here. As I've mentioned, this is part 41. This is our study that we uh, we began after I had preached at Holston PBU Church. I preached about rethinking the resurrection, and I challenged us with a whole bulletin of Bible verses. It was impossible in an hour and a half to go through all the Bible verses, so I summarized the corporate body view, which I have a bunch of personal blogs uh, about, so I'll mention my blog site here in a moment. Uh, so I taught on the corporate body view in a summarized fashion, and I promised a study as the outworking of that. That's what this has been, was uh, an outworking, going through every one of those verses. And while some of those people, many of those people are not here live with us, uh, they have been going through the resources, and thank you for sharing them and, and reading and following along. So uh, mianogonewild.wordpress.com is my personal blog site. If you go over there each week, I provide not only the link to this video on YouTube, I provide the written notes from this session. Sometimes I'll include the thoughts that were shared here live as well uh, and include those resources that each of us might mention. So you can go ahead and visit. And of course, uh, what I want to encourage you to do is go over to my blog site, mianogonewild.wordpress.com and put in corporate body view or even just CBV. And you'll get a host of blogs that'll pop up just by doing that alone uh, that help you understand uh, what I believe in totality. Uh, and then you could go through these videos and say, does that match with what he's saying? Does that match with that idea? So um, I appreciate Jonathan Buttrey and the opportunity I had to preach that sermon there that go through that conference. And I appreciated the other speakers. And I hope this has just continued to add to uh, what we presented at that conference. That being said, let's go ahead and pray. And then we'll jump right in on talking about what we're going to do here for our part 41. Mighty God, we do thank you. We praise you for all that we have in you. We thank you that you provide the spirit that helps us discern these things, because these things truly are spiritually discerned. Let us not lean on our own understanding. Let us not lean on the understanding of our neighbor, our pastor, our best friend, our mother, our father, but rather, Lord, a lean on the understanding that we might gain by seeking, searching, studying, and proving the things of God that we would rejoice like the noble Bereans did when they searched the scriptures, that we would not find ourselves ashamed uh, as those that study appropriately, that we would prove all things so that we might not find ourselves deceived. Uh, and Lord, that we would search all things because we know in searching, we find you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being the author and finisher of our faith, for being the resurrection, the life, the truth, the way, uh, and all those other glorious ways that we can approach you and understand you. Lord, continue to reveal yourself to us tonight. Give us that humility to learn and discern rather than to know it all. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me pull up my notes here. Again, part 41. And as a matter of introduction, I'd just like to say that resurrection of the dead is the hope. That's the hope. That's what we're summarizing here. The one hope of Israel. Paul said that he was on trial for preaching the resurrection of the dead. He was on trial for the hope of Israel. He testified in Ephesians that there is one hope. So 
What we've been doing here through this study is in a narrative fashion, understanding how each of the scriptures, the proof text, if you will, lead up to explaining this one hope. I do believe in the harmony of scripture. I believe that uh, these things work together. Uh, I believe it's important to use cross-referencing and, and to gain a narrative understanding first and foremost, but then to do cross-referencing and uh, leaning in on commentaries and understandings that have been provoked by other Christians, I think is very beneficial. And hopefully that's what I've proven to do as we've gone through this study. I've already mentioned my blog site. So uh, what I'd like to do is just mention one resource right away. I listened to Daniel Rogers' recent message at the Fulfilled uh, Media Bible Conference. And what he had preached on there, and I provided this link on my blog site so you can go back and do some review there. Uh, what he did was he presented uh, John 5 and Daniel 12. And he went through John 5 first, and then at the end, tacked on Daniel 12 to help you see how they, they correspond to one another. They have similar expressions, to borrow a phrase from him. So what I, what I have to mention right at the outset, before we jump over to John 5, and we did study through John 3, so I'd encourage you to go back to our part 40 and look at what we had said there about John 3. And of course, we're going to continue to build on that as we're only two chapters ahead. Uh, that being said, what Daniel did was he wanted us to think back. So he wanted us to think back when we're looking at John 5, he wanted us to think about John 2, 3, and 4. And he said some really interesting things. Like, for example, in John 2, we read about the wedding at Cana, right? And we know that the first miracle Jesus did was he turned water into wine. And, uh, you know, people talk about it all the time. Obviously, the theological significance, just like many other truths in the Bible, is often missed. And the theological significance that Daniel highlighted was that in Isaiah chapter 1, in a time where they were truly hoping for the hope of Israel because all they had within themselves was unrighteousness, and uh, they had death was manifesting itself in the people of Israel. And Isaiah prophesied toward uh, what they're going to face in their immediate circumstances, uh, which would have been important for a prophet to do, and then, of course, provokes what's going to happen in the latter days. And one of the things he says right at the very beginning of the book, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 22, is he says that the silver has become dross and the wine has become diluted. This is negative. This is not good. So what does this mean? This means, and again, we know the totality of Isaiah's prophecy, was talking to Israel and how they had become a people that had become darkness rather than light. Israel was called to be a light to the nations, but rather they became darkness. And darkness just envelops and creates more darkness. And that's what they were doing within themselves. They were manifesting death is the theological idea. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 22, when it talks about the wine being diluted, what is Jesus's first miracle in John chapter 2? That he takes the water and he turns it into wine. Talk about not being diluted. Uh, he, he basically makes wine out of the water. A beautiful miracle, showing that this was the time of fulfillment of those promises going back to Isaiah. And then, of course, in cha John chapter 3, uh, we talked about the being born from above, the spirit, right, the spirit birth uh, that we must undergo, which is pointing back to Ezekiel chapter 37, quite a few other texts in the book of Ezekiel and other prophetic literature where God would provide a spirit, would provide a new heart for his people, uh, would pour out his spirit from above and provide a new heart for his people. So in John 3, we see Jesus talking to Nicodemus about that. And then sure enough, in John 4, with the woman at the well, Jesus talks about a time where God will be worshipped in what? In spirit and in truth. And this is in contrast to the, the fleshly way the people of God were living, uh, the false way that the people were living that Jesus rebuked all throughout his ministry. So what Daniel did was he had us think back and realize that these texts in John, and he even went back to John chapter one. However, I want to encourage you to go listen to him. He explained it far better than I could. So he mentioned John one, brought you back to the Old Testament. John two, brought, well, I think most of us can say just by reading John one, one, that it takes us back to the Old Testament, it takes us back far further than that, possibly. Uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about the prophets and, and you know, again, prophesying to the Messiah, so that being said, I'll let Daniel uh, deal with John 1, John 2, Isaiah 1, uh, and again, probably many other texts. However, these are just some that Daniel had mentioned, John 3 and 4, Ezekiel 37. So what we know as we enter in on this text is that we must still have in mind the Old Testament prophecies, if not the entire time you're reading the New Testament. 
But that's something I think is very important because I know many people, and maybe some of you here live uh, know people that just jump into the New Testament and assume all sorts of things. Well, now our assumption entering in on this is that we must be thinking about the things of the Old Testament. We must be thinking of the way the prophets foretold the hope of Israel, which we've gone through here, obviously. This is part 41. So we've gone through this study. Now let's go ahead and with all of that in mind, with our presupposition admitted, let's go ahead and move over to John chapter 5. I encourage you to find the Bible that works for you or a Bible app that works for you, and uh, we'll jump in here. And I'm going to just jump right in on our text tonight, 24 through 29. Of course, uh, when we go into our discussion session, if you feel there's things that need to be extracted from other portions within this text, please feel free to do so. Uh, I understand that I'm just kind of jumping right into the conversation. Uh, so here in John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Now, the first thing I would encourage you to do is double back a bit and uh, go to verse 18 or maybe even further than that, and find out who Jesus is speaking to. A matter of fact, let's just look at John chapter 5, verse 1. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Uh, so he's in Jerusalem, and he's talking to people that were there. And if you notice verse 10, therefore the Jews were saying to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. So there's all these responses. Jesus is responding back and forth to the Jews that are at Jerusalem. Very important to think about there. So that's who Jesus is talking to. Thought. Truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but passed, at, but has passed out of death into life. I'm going to keep reading, and then I'm going to double back and uh, make some points about each of the verses. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear shall live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice, and shall come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, and those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So first, the first thing I bring up when I talk about this text, and I'm just going to share tonight as if I was talking with a friend, uh, which lately has been the case, and, and kind of just going through these things. The first thing that I would mention is this truly, truly phrase. That why is this being used here? Why is, it, why is Jesus speaking like this? Amen and amen is the way that we would understand it. This is a phrase in the Hebraic mind that is used before what they call a mashal. And a mashal is a difficult saying. So Every time you see Jesus say something that might be difficult for some people to accept, or not every time, but many of the times, you're going to see this phrase, truly, truly, I say to you. Uh, one commentary had noted the doubled ver verily or truly denotes that what follows is of especially weighty and solemn significance. So we are to pay special attention. So whenever you see those truly, truly, it's sort of like pause and Follow what's going on here. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Notice eternal life is in contrast to coming into judgment. If you have eternal life, you don't come into judgment. Many of you might be familiar with teachings I've taught before about why we don't have to face a judgment day or face a judgment. Uh, I, unfortunately, in my life, uh, it's Testimony Tuesday, so I'll just share a brief moment here. Uh, I've had to go in front of a judge. I've had to deal with being sentenced. And I understand the, the trauma, if you will, that can come from that. So when I hear Christians talk about we're in Christ and we're going to face a judgment where all of our misdeeds are going to be brought before us and we're going to have to, you know, make amends or whatever it might be. That stands in contradiction to the grace that I've understood through Jesus Christ. 
So outside of preterism, that, that's been a point that I've made in, in my exegesis of understanding judgment. Now, that being said, we notice here in the text, eternal life is in contrast to coming into judgment. If we have eternal life, which, you know, John chapter 3, our favorite text, John 3, 16, right? Whoever believes in Jesus Christ has eternal life and will not perish is the contrast there. Perishing would be equated to this facing judgment picture here, or at least having, maybe not. I would say standing before the judge would then determine uh, the good and the bad, but we'll get to that here in a moment. Uh, notice those who believe in him uh, pass out of death into life and have eternal life. I have to double back here to John three eighteen where Jesus says, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So there you have it. If you can believe, and I, I say that intentionally, if you can believe, now I'm not talking about, you know, Arminian theology or anything to that effect. I'm saying if you can believe, in other words, you're alive and you even have opportunity for God to turn your heart, turn your mind toward Jesus Christ, you can pass out of judgment into life. The question we're going to have to answer, and we're going to see in this very next text, is what about those who were dead when Jesus was talking, who would not come into life after Jesus's ministry to have opportunity to believe in him? What about them? And that would have been the Jewish problem, as we talked about with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, already in this study. So I believe very clearly here, this is talking about those that are living. And that's going to be important. I think most of you that are here are very familiar with my teaching on the, the sleep, the living, and the dead uh, as three con contrasting identities within the time of resurrection. Uh, the living can experience resurrection right here by believing in Jesus. They hear the word of truth, they repent, they turn to Jesus, and they're in the faith. So the next verse Truly, truly, again, something else you want, to, you want to take your time and think about these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of God, and those who hear shall live. So where have we heard this phrase, an hour is coming, and now is? If you just double back one chapter, go back to John chapter 4. Jesus talking to the woman at the well, verse 23. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. So an hour is coming and now is. Interesting that Daniel Rogers brings up in 1 John 2, 18, we read, it is the last hour. <laughs> so there it is. John was one of the later texts in your New Testament. He was saying, it's the last hour. That was the that, that time was coming. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 says, at that hour, we'll get, we'll actually look at that here in a moment. So the living could hear in the now uh, when Jesus was speaking, whereas, and again, there were living dead, right? We know those that were dead in sin. Whereas the dead ones, the dead, they shall hear in the future at some time after this conversation that Jesus is having in John chapter five. So the question we have to ask ourselves at this point is what could that future moment be? Is it something we're still waiting on? And, and we're gonna see as we conclude this text tonight that the text for, points it out for us when that time would be, or at least understanding a bit of exegesis helps us understand when that time would be that those who hear shall live. Those dead that could not, simply believe in Jesus, but rather needed a moment, needed something to happen so that they would be able to hear and live. I find it interesting that uh, Kenneth Gentry uh, talks about uh, the Daniel and, and what's going on in Daniel. And he says this, if I may, real briefly, I want to jump back in my Bible to Daniel chapter 12. verse one, and it says, now at that time, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. There will be a time of distress that has never occurred since there was a nation 
until that time. And at that time, your people, every one who is found written in the book will be rescued. Apparently, uh, some translations use the term hour. Uh, at that hour, uh, these things will take place. So there has been some correlation between uh, the hour that we see here uh, in John 5, 25, and then ultimately Daniel 12. So um, that being said, we'll, I think we'll see even more of that. Kenneth Gentry, in his book, He Shall Have Dominion, says this, Daniel appears to be presenting Israel as a gravesite under God's curse. Israel as a corporate body is in the dust. He connects Daniel 12 and Genesis 3. In this, he follows Ezekiel's pattern in his vision of the dry bones, Ezekiel 37 which represents Israel's death in Babylonian dispersion. In Daniel's prophecy, many will awaken, as it were, during the Great Tribulation to suffer the full fury of the divine wrath, while others will enjoy God's grace in receiving everlasting life. So again, he understood, uh, you know, Kenneth Gentry would be what we would call a partial preterist. So he understood that the Great Tribulation was in the first century. And he correlated Daniel that resurrection that Daniel's talking about with AD 70. Uh, and again, he, the, the words he uses are very important to take note of. Daniel appears to be presenting Israel as a gravesite. That's going to be important because I'll share with you a bit here in a little bit uh, about uh, what some say about the graves that we're going to see in the next part of this text. So continuing, uh, John 5, 26, for just as the father has life in himself, even so he gave the son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Well, uh, what we see just being plain and simple here is the father gave authority to the son. That authority was to give life and to execute judgment. That's what the son is walking in. And that's what he's testifying to right there, saying things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can get to the father except through me. A son of man is an interesting phrase. As we know, this is a prophetic phrase regarding the Son of God, Jesus, and brings our attention to those texts, again, that I mentioned at the very beginning, Daniel, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. Uh, we need to be thinking, and especially Daniel and Ezekiel, uh, where these phrases are used. So uh, just in my estimation here, what we're seeing is the authority that the Father had all throughout the Old Covenant uh, is now being given to the Son. The Son is testifying to it, and obviously testifying to it in a fashion that's bringing our minds back to the Old Testament hopes and how that's being fulfilled in and through him. I think it's, uh, I think all of us know the phrase where Jesus said, I think it's in John 11 for that matter, I am the resurrection and the life. So Jesus is testifying to who he is. That's what all of this stuff is about, the, all, all this prophetic literature. So continuing in the text, John 5, 28, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice. You notice he didn't say the hour is now where before he kept saying the hour is now end is coming. So there is a distinction here between the living and the dead. Here, the dead, those that are in the tombs, are those that are going to have to wait for the time that is coming. And again, we're going we're gonna to get to what time that is uh, here in a moment. What I find interesting about 528 is do not marvel at this. Why would he say this? Why would he, it's not as though he's talking and you know, he's stopping. Jesus is just continuing to talk. And then he says, do not marvel at this. I found it interesting that if you go back to John 3, 7, that's what Jesus said when he was talking about being born from above to Nicodemus. Uh, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, John, I'm sorry, this is John 3, 5, uh, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So why is Jesus using that there? He's kind of, it's like a facetious, phrase so it's the same thing here in john 5 do not marvel at this why because this is what your old, your prophets hoped for this shouldn't sound strange to you an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice remember the thought i just shared with you from uh kenneth gentry where he said daniel appears to be presenting israel as a gravesite under god's curse there's your uh your tombs your, your people that are dead in the tombs The dead are in contrast to the living who can hear now. They shall hear his voice, the dead, and come forth. This is the hope of Israel. 
This is what their hope was, that the old covenant dead would find a time that uh, God would do this work to raise up, bring vengeance upon their adversaries, raise them up for judgment. And again, it's important to mention Daniel chapter 12. I think we've already started there. Now we're seeing that's what this picture was. This is that resurrection that we're going to see in the very next verse. Uh, do not marvel at this for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Those who did good deeds to resurrection of life, those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. That's Daniel chapter 12. That's where you read that. Of course, we've already mentioned Ezekiel 37 being in the mind of the reader and those that were listening uh, from John chapter one forward. Uh, and then, of course, Isaiah 24 through 28, I think if you were to go back and read about, you know, read those texts and then read John one through five, uh, you'll see some similarities as well. Uh, obviously, that's a fairly in-depth study, so I'd encourage you to do that on your own. Again, alluding back to that uh, presentation by Daniel Rogers, Daniel said that Daniel 12 is the base note of all of these texts. So when you get to Daniel 12, you begin to get some answers. If you don't mind, I hope you don't, uh, turn with me to Daniel chapter 12. And we did a study on this text already. However, I want to remind us of the very clear indications that are found in the text. Let's start at verse 1. Now, at that time, what time, or at that hour, I believe is what some translations say, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never has occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, sort of like those that are in tombs. These to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. It's exactly what we read in John 5, 28, or 29 for that matter. And those who have insight, notice the contrast. So you have, there's going to be uh, those that are asleep in the dust will awake to resurrection. Those who have insight, those that are alive and believe, will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's the living believers that testify to the truth of Jesus Christ. That's these stars that are going, they're the living that are able to believe in Jesus Christ and experience eternal life. And then, of course, as John 5 talks about, those that are in the tombs are going to raise at a period of time. This text is going to show us what time that's going to be. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal them up in a book at the end. Uh, let me say this right here, right? Uh, seal up the book until the end of time. Obviously, many of us know it's supposed to say the time of the end. I think many of us have heard sermons on that before. Uh, many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others were standing on the bank of the river and the other on the other bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? And it, that's a very natural question. Uh, when will these things be? And I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times and a half a time. And as soon as they fi finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. So according to Daniel 12, if Daniel 12 and John 5 are talking about the same thing, which unless you have some sort of strange hermeneutic that leads you to say otherwise, it's impossible not to see the correlations between the text. So now you have John 5, which is written in that later on period. Ironically enough, John is the one who writes Revelation, where these things are now unsealed, right? Don't seal them up. Uh, this is the Revelation. John would have understood, John is relaying what this is not answering the questions that Daniel would have had. John has that wisdom. It's Jesus. And Daniel gives the time here. So time, times and a half a time. Uh, again, I encourage you to go back and listen to our John uh, Daniel 12 study. Uh, however, uh, I think most folks would agree that's three and a half years. Uh, so you have three and a half years. You go to Revelation, you understand the 42 months. You have three and a half years. Uh, you have a pretty simple correlation to when this happened. And then, of course, you study a little bit of history and you find out the Roman Jewish war was from 66 to 70. Your three and a half years becomes very easy to understand. Uh, that being said, the second part of that is the shattering of the power of the holy people. That's the destruction of the temple. 
And this is when these events would be completed. As for me, I heard but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up till the time of the end. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. And then it goes on to give you more time indications of when this stuff would happen. That's what's going on. Daniel 12 is the base note of these texts. If you understand what Daniel 12 is pointing to, the shattering of the power of the holy people, the three and a half years, then you look at John's text and John 5 particularly here, uh, you begin to understand that this is talking about AD 70. Yes, you could believe in Jesus at that very moment and experience eternal life. However, the dead ones, the old covenant dead, needed to be raised. That's a part of the promises. If you're bringing our minds back to the Old Testament, which I told you our presupposition before we got in our, on our study tonight was that we're looking back to the Old Testament texts because John is having us do that from John chapter one all the way forward. What is a base note? I looked that up and uh, they say that one of the definitions is that it's the longest lasting element of a fragrance. So if any of you use perfume, cologne, uh, that, that longing, the longest smell, the element that stays the longest is the base note. Or uh, it's the foundation of a pyramid structure, the base note, that, that bottom piece. It's what holds everything else up. Daniel 12 is the base note of all of these texts. It's what should be the, 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 the fragrance that remains. When you read the text, you should always be going back to Daniel chapter 12. Uh, and it's the, uh, the foundation to what we're establishing here. I had shared a, a study, if you go back to my blog site, uh, from Holger Neubauer, where he wrote a, a blog, a little write-up called The Dead Body Rises. And all he did was include a couple verses and just have you think them through. I'm going to read them to you briefly. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you that dwell in the dust. For the dew is as the dew of her herbs and the earth shall cast out her dead. If you don't see the correlations between what you're reading in John 5 and, and what Isaiah had to say, the, Isaiah was hoping for these things. Uh, I'd encourage you to keep reading. John 5, 24 through 25, truly, truly, I say to you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has eternal life and shall not come into condemnation or judgment, as some translations say, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. John 5, 28 through 29, marvel not at this. An hour is coming in which all in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Romans chapter 8, verse 10, if Christ be in you, thy, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And we haven't moved in on Romans text. Don't worry, we will soon. John 8. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We, I think we did cover uh, John 5 and John 8. So uh, we did cover Romans uh, and we dealt with that text very briefly. Uh, I demonstrate the corporate body view of Romans 8. Uh, and then of course, Romans 8, 23. And not only they, but ourselves that have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. And then Romans 9, 4, who are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption? Well, it's not a question. Who are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption? That's the way it should be read in Romans 9. Uh, this was their hope. And this is what we're talking about here with the resurrection. The resurrection hope was that adoption, was that fellowship, was that resurrection into fellowship life, relationship life, uh, identity life, that we can have an identity in Christ because of righteousness rather than being dead in sin. Another resource that I had mentioned uh, early on was Mike Sullivan's detailing of this text. And he says this, uh, he gives you kind of five points that you need to understand regarding John 5. The resurrection in the immediate context is spiritual. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you live, you have eternal life. The eschatological, not yet coming hour of John 4 is referring to AD 70. The resurrection of Daniel 12 verses two through three, was fulfilled in AD 70. Jesus references this in John 5, verses 28 through 29. Number four, Jesus elsewhere teaches that the resurrection of Daniel 12, two through three, 
would be at the end of the Old Covenant age in AD 70. Matthew chapter 13, uh, verses 39 through 43. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, as well as verses 30 through 31 and 34. Uh, this generation shall not pass away. And lastly, John 5, John's eschatological last hour in 1 John 2, 17 through 18, and the hour of judging the dead in Revelation 14, 7 was fulfilled in AD 70. So again, there's five points to show you that John 5 was fulfilled in AD 70. That's the resurrection connecting back to Daniel 12 from Mike Sullivan. I do have the link provided in my resource, uh, so I'll encourage you to go ahead and check that out. Uh, definitely be blessed by what he had to bring forth in regards to John chapter 5. One last thing I'll mention about resources, and then I'll bring on everyone for a bit of discussion, uh, is one of the links I had shared was about those who were attempting to respond to or refute full preterism. I later found out that that was actually Reverend Brian Shortley, who has been an antagonist of preterism for longer than I've been a preterist. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I that kind of changed my idea. Oh, he's just always going to argue, no matter what, uh, even if his points didn't make much sense. Uh, I will say, uh, Mike Sullivan responded to this point. Brian Shortley's main point in that video was, does grave mean grave? Or is it referring to souls of men that were living in Hades? And he made this whole big thing about how it means grave. So it's not talking about the souls, the people in Hades that are waiting to be resurrected, but rather it's about the body that was in the grave. This is how Mike Sullivan already provided an answer before Brian Shortley made the video. Uh, Mike Sullivan already responded to such an idea. In order to understand John 5, 28 and 29, we must first look three verses above it in John 5, 25, where Jesus said that the hour now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. As most Reformed interpreters agree, Jesus in that verse was referring to the preaching of his death and resurrection. The preaching of that message commenced at Pentecost. The dead were physically living people who were spiritually dead in sin, and the voice of the Son of God was the gospel. Having heard the gospel, those who were spiritually dead were spiritually resurrected. They lived in that they received eternal life through faith in the gospel, the voice of the Son of God. Then, in verses 28 and 29, Jesus expanded his teaching on the resurrection to include those who were not only spiritually dead, but those who were also physically dead. He did not call them dead, as he had already called the living who were spiritually dead, but he referred to them through another figure of speech, all who are in the graves. They were not literally in graves or tombs, of course, because they were in Hades or Sheol. That's where their true being was. The body was laid in the grave, but where was the being? When Jesus's body was laid in the grave, where was his being? The distinctions between, so let me end that quote there. Mike Sullivan responds to this. And what I also find very interesting is if you review the resource by Mike Sullivan, he provides that quote from Kenneth Gentry, where Kenneth Gentry himself says, who's not a full preterist, says that Daniel 12 was highlighting that Israel had become a grave, that the people themselves had become their own grave. That's Kenneth Gentry's words, partial preterist. So it's not some sort of full preterist idea to say that this was a corporate picture of Israel, Old Covenant Israel being dead. And yes, being physically dead as well, absolutely. Moses and all the people you read about in Hebrews 11 and all the people you don't read about in Hebrews chapter 11 were a part of that Old Covenant identity that needed to be raised and judged in either going into eternal life or eternal death. The second thing I wanna mention before I go ahead and uh, unmute mics was uh, a reminder of what I've taught before. You have to see the distinction between the living, the asleep, and the dead, and how they're finding and living in eternal life. That's what's going on in your New Testament. There's different responses to different questions. We know in 1 Thessalonians 4, the question was, what about those that have fallen asleep? Then in 1 Corinthians 15, it's what about the dead ones? There's no resurrection of the dead ones. And then many times there was just simply, this is not the right message for any of us to hear. This is Beelzebub, uh, is what we see the, the, the Jews saying. So then there was stuff the living needed to understand about the message of Jesus and how it affected them. There was things the asleep 
we need to understand about those that had fallen asleep during that period of transition. Uh, and then of course the dead ones. Uh, we need to see these as three separate distinct identities and how the New Testament is responding to the concerns about all three. And that's what I have for tonight. I will go ahead and unmute mics. Please let me know if you agree, uh, what some of your thoughts are regarding the text. And of course, if you have any other resources to bring up. I agree 100%. And where I, where I had wanted to go was uh, Daniel 12, verse 2, where it says, and many of those who speak in the dust of the ground will awake. Uh, these to everlasting faith, but uh, others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Uh, and in Daniel, uh, not, not, uh, not Daniel, uh, John 5, let me go there, John 5, 22, which reads, for not even the father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the son. So basically, um, those um, with the shattering of the power of the holy people, all these things will be completed. All these things is, is basically the hope, the hope. Those that, that were in the dust or in the tombs that needed to be raised would be raised for, for judgment and Jesus would be that judge in his return in the year 70. Um, uh, yes, because they they did not have the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus, but but um, but when Jesus calls them, and 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 they are raised in, into judgment, and they're judged according to to what they have done according to the law, you know, uh, yes. And uh, there was another point I wanted to bring in that, as far as uh, them being raised. Um, because we know that uh, the living that were dead in Christ, that were alive, when they believed, they passed from death to life. We know that, and those that died in Christ, the sleep, that, that they would come back with Jesus when he had come. Uh, we understand that. But um, as far as those that needed to be raised, because they had not the opportunity to hear Jesus. And oh, that's what I wanted to bring. Uh, his sheep hears his voice. <laughs> so when he calls them, you know, they, they arise, you know. So, yes, um, that's basically kind of like what I wanted to share that had come to mind. Well, I appreciate what you said, and I might just want to uh, tack on to something you had mentioned. The, it would be the, the living would be changed, right? The, the asleep yeah. would come with Jesus. And the word that the First Corinthians 15 uses regarding the dead is anastasis that they would be made to stand again and that was the goal. they would stand again and they would stand in judgment uh so that that was kind of the idea so you have three different pictures you have the living being changed because you've already passed out of judgment they just need to have a change of mind that's the greek word alasso uh, and you have uh the asleep again the phrase there would be parousia or um what's the other one um I think many of us know there's kind of three words in First Thessalonians 41, harpazo, uh, that they were gathered together. Um, you, you know, so that's what you have. You have the asleep gathered, you have the living changed, and you have the dead being made to stand again. Uh, that's the picture of resurrection. And, and then, and then the, uh, the, the living being changed. Um, when, 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 when we had read that verse where it talked about uh, believing in Christ, you know, so uh, not... Uh, they had to change their mind from the old covenant way of thinking, the law of Moses, into the law of grace, you know, through Jesus Christ. You know, uh, it's right. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever had uh, one of your hopes fulfilled, and and the change of mind that it does, it you know, it tends to to change you a bit. You know, it's like, man, this is right. This you know, this worked out well. This was great. Um, that's you know, not obviously. I don't want to uh, limit the, the spiritual significance of the change. However. Uh, just on a very natural level, I can understand what it means to go from one mind to another and saying, you know, th this is confirming things that I'm understanding. So thank you, Edward. Appreciate your thoughts. Anyone want to jump in? Sure. I'll uh, dogpile on to where Edward went to, because that's a fun, very, very fun scripture. <clears throat> 
I just want to throw this out just for a, a quick remembrance, because talking about the corporate body view, uh, we got to go back to Adam. Okay, so what is the body here? It's Adam, Abel, Cain, Enosh, Seth, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who became Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, and those who covenanted with them. That's the body that we're talking about, just as some of those became the body of Jesus. So the body of Jesus is not the body of Adam. Moses is a member. Israel is a member of the body of Adam. So all of the judgment of Adam was being played out on this one member. So let's keep that in mind, because I think that really also helps to uh, keep that that corporate view apart because we use those words all the time but we lose that picture and i think that's just a friendly reminder because now in christ there is no other peoples there's just that one and it's jesus christ and his covering so that's a big difference between the bodies anyway i say that but now just to jump into that uh daniel uh, the point that uh, i want to point out here just to remind us of how much this is a covenantal thing it's not a physical thing and uh tying those scriptures together what we went over so in daniel 12 it says he's talking about to those who sleep in the dust this should be extremely extremely important to the reader's mind and make us go all the way back to adam specifically why well where did adam come from god ray took him from the dust of the ground and then what did he do in verse two seven uh two seven God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into him life. Well, that's fascinating because when Jesus brought forth his new body, his new members, and they were what? According to Daniel, in the dust, Jesus breathed into them and they became living beings with the spirit imbuing into them. So that parallel cannot be dodged here because this is about covenantal position not about a physical body coming out of the grave. So this is very important to understand. It's about the body of Adam. And then in Genesis 3, 17, this is important because it, this is when Adam was cursed. What does it say? It says, cursed are you for doing the things that we all know he did. And what was his curse, his punishment? You're going to return to the dust. So that's very important. We can't talk about resurrection from the dead if we're reading Daniel, because Daniel tells us it's the dust. Well, the, if we read Daniel, then we know exactly who the dust is. It's Adam. So this is talking about the resurrection, the bringing of life, the transferring of Adam from what? From darkness, death, the curse, being outside of the presence of God and giving him a new body to join this body of light and life and blessing being back inside the presence of God. So the whole old body of Adam perished and a new body was created. You, there's no choice. You can't be in either the body of Adam or the body of Jesus. There is only one body. So that's what jumps out at me with Daniel. And I'm really glad that you brought that up, Edward, because I hadn't really focused in on that. But when you started talking about the dust, uh, really just like, oh, yeah, well, obviously that's we're taking Daniel going forward into the resurrection to bring back the corporate. I'm just bringing it back to Adam for the whole picture. So cool. I appreciate those thoughts. And absolutely, you know, we began our study uh, looking at that story of Adam. Uh, and obviously there's still things that I would want to say and bring up, but I don't want to take us too far back. Uh, but I, I do think that, um, or even too far forward, uh, you, you know, because I think there's even some questions as to uh, what does this look like? post-resurrection of the dead. Uh, so that's something we might have to deal with at the conclusion of our study. Um, so again, I appreciate what you said, Dallas, and I do. I think we need to be taking this back. Dust, obviously, is a very uh, important phrase. And I, you know, identity in Adam, I, I always say that the word body, uh, in my estimation, is better translated as identity. So the identity in Adam is definitely what was being undone. We've seen that in Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, um, among other texts. So I appreciate what you said there. And, and I definitely, uh, it gave me some thoughts. So I don't want to talk too much because I'm still kind of thinking through what you said, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Well, that's just that quick understanding of if we're talking about the resurrection of the dead, who needed to be raised from the dead. So that's cool. Amen. Like those that, uh, like Adam violated the covenant. 
Uh, that's, you know, that's the picture. So, amen. I could jump in. Um, hey, Matt, good evening. Hey, sorry I was late. I know I missed most of it, but I'm assuming you guys were on John 5, 24 to 29. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, really like what Dallas said. Uh, that was a very cool connection to um, Daniel 12, Genesis 2, 7. Uh, very interesting. Um, I just wanted to, you kind of touched on it already, Mike, but, um, in, in relation to, um, what was I going to say? John, John 5, 24 and like 28, like those verses there. Um, you kind of already touched on what those verses mean and, I was going to ask a question about that because I don't really have a, I don't really have a solid, like, you know, opinion, I guess it's sort of, I sort of loosely hold that when Jesus says um, that the dead who hear will, will come, will pass out of death into life. Um, I do. I think, like you said, I take that as um, those who were living, but were, you know, spiritually dead or covenantally dead and um and when they believed and heard his voice then they they came to life and then um the second part so when he says an hour is coming you i think you also said that those who are in the tombs refer to like the old covenant you know people and even those even like people maybe people that died in in christ and you know um, and I was going to ask a question about that because that's what I was kind of seeing too. And I, and I can't help but sort of like think about this makes me think about Revelation 20 about the two resurrections. You know, I kind of like see because it's just like it's almost uncanny um, where it says like, you know, those who take part in the first resurrection, uh, the second death will have no uh, power over them. And then in the in the in the other resurrection it's like they all, they're, they're all judged according to their deeds, you know? And so I guess the thing I wanted to say was if that's what, if that's what you were saying, um, I kind of wanted to, well, I wanted to ask a question first and then, and then point out um, like another thing about that, that I was seeing. So how does this correlate to, okay. So when Jesus says like, um, they don't come into judgment. Those who believe have eternal life. They don't come into judgment, but have passed out of death into life. How does that line up with what Paul says in like maybe Romans 14, where he says each one will give an account. Each one of us will give an account of himself to God or, or even like second Corinthians where he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. How, if, if Christ is saying, well, he doesn't come into, ju into judgment. Um, what does Paul mean then when he says like we got it we have to give an account? Yeah, so uh, a couple things. Now, Second Corinthians would be the easier one that I would say it's uh, of the old covenant identity uh, that they would all have to give an account. That was kind of a transition right from old to new. Uh, so that would definitely be a part of that. Now with Romans fourteen, um, okay. Um, you know, I don't know that I would have as, as easy of an answer there, uh, but what I would say, I guess, you know, to kind of summarize my thought, just a simple response there without exegeting things, I would say, um, I believe that when I believe in Jesus Christ, that is a part of my accounting. Jesus took, Jesus took my sins, right? So that is my accounting. Jesus cleared the account for me. So for me, and I explained this a little bit before you came in, uh, I have a problem with people saying that there's a, a judgment that all Christians have to face. Um, being that, you know, I, I've stood in judgment before in my life and the judgment alone is trauma. So, uh, and I believe that was a necessary part of that old covenant picture for that judgment to occur, uh, for the identities to be judged. It was a part of the promise. Um, so for me, when I understand no condemnation in Christ, Romans eight, one, uh, for me, that's, it, it aligns with what I read in John five, where we've passed out of judgment into life, uh, the living, if they put their faith in Christ. I don't live under that old covenant identity. I, you know, I never did, uh, but I've I'm in Christ. So my accounting 
to use that phrase there, uh, has been done for. And I, I, my accounting has been handled. It's like Christ showing up as my lawyer at a court so that I didn't have to stand in front of the judge and feel that way. Christ did that for me. And not only was my, he my lawyer, he was, you know, don't want to minimize it. Uh, he was everything. You know, he was the payment. He was the restitution. He was everything that was needed for my judgment to pass away. So that's kind of the way I see that there. Uh, and just to respond briefly uh, to what you said about John 5, I, I believe there's a couple things going on. I think you, I'm sure you caught that. Uh, that I think that the first John 4, uh, John 5, 24, that's two living people, no doubt about it. Uh, I believe John 5, uh, 5, 25, that's to living people, no doubt about it. Do you think that correlates to, re to the Revelation verse? Because again, I hold this yeah. sort of loosely. I'm not saying this is it, but I it do, seems like it does. I do believe, uh, you know, Dallas mentioned that earlier as well. Uh, you know, we, we, we're going to deal with that. I'll let everyone know uh, that's on our list of verses. So we're going to make our way there. Um, but I don't know that Revelation 20 should cause the hiccup in John 5, if anything. If we're following a proper biblical chronology, it would be John 5 should cause a hiccup in whatever you got going on in Revelation 20, because John 5 is written first. So here we are looking at John 5, and we have to take in what this is saying before we demand whatever Revelation 20 is saying. You see, sure. I think some people do that backwards, and I'm like, well, no, that sure. this has to influence your understanding of John, John uh, Revelation 20. So uh, I do believe that, though, by the way, and I believe exactly I don't want to say exactly because we didn't sit here and have a full explanation, but the way you outlined the first resurrection and what you had said there about the second resurrection, it sounds as though we're agreeing the first resurrection is those that are alive, find resurrection life in Christ. Those that are waiting a judgment period are going to be those that are going to be raised up and have to face that judgment according to everything that they had done. Yeah, because um, because like it also says, I think I'm not, I don't have, I'm not at that page, but in revelation it says that those who were beheaded for the testimony of christ so those would be those who heard him you know while he was alive Amen. and then were and then were killed but they but but that would be they would pass out of judgment because you know what right. i mean like it sort of fits still. i do and if i may say one thing that's interesting about that is connecting that with john 5 is interesting because in john 5 i'm saying the graves is a sort of metaphor for the dead, right? And then I'm also saying the beheaded is a metaphor for the martyrs in Christ, because some will bring up that uh, many of the living believers in Christ during that period of time weren't being beheaded. That wasn't necessarily the form of uh, persecution. And then they bring up a latter period and it causes a hiccup in some people's understanding of the millennium. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, for me, I think it's interesting to see John's doing that in both of those texts, sort of using a metaphor to describe the people here the graves in john 5 is talking about the old covenant dead and in revelation 20 the beheaded is simply speaking about martyrdom not necessarily yeah, right really beheaded. that's kind of how i saw it too yeah yeah amen good points okay. yeah i do agree with you and um go ahead please before you move on uh, can i jump to your uh, verse 24 for one sec can i give you a, is that cool yeah. sure Okay, so if we read 24, uh, we will read that this is talking about the uh, Exodus 19.5 agreement. So this is talking about covenantal relations, as it says, uh, <laughs> him who sent me now has eternal life and does not come un into judgment. Now, here comes the description of what that's talking about. It says right after there, but has passed out of death into life. Death and life are covenantal positions so just like with adam he was given the tree of life or the tree of death just like israel was given you can either choose death or you can choose life and both are described as being in the blessing or being in the curse so what this is talking about is simply by trusting in jesus they have been transferred out of the death and the curse that's where judgment is They've been transferred out of that and have been brought into the body of Christ who will receive no judgment because you're now in the right body. So that's all that's talking about. Sure. That makes that makes a lot of sense also because, um, you know, this is talking about the hour now is. So it's talking to those who are able to make that decision. And um, and then later it's talking about those who are in the tombs who hadn't um, had the revelation of, of Christ you know, visibly in front of them. So that, that's, that was the other point I wanted to make was just what I'm seeing there is that, you know, they would have, they would have to be judged by their deeds. 
by their obedience, in other words, because because Christ wasn't there, right? He wasn't there at that time for them. Okay, so now here goes to that second point. They don't, they're no longer judged. Why? Because they died in Christ. When they died in Christ, they're no longer under the law. They, their judgment was in Christ when he went to the cross. They were in Christ. When Christ died to the law and he took that judgment, then so were they. So they were no longer under the judgment. They were no, it was no longer applicable to them. They were no longer married to the law. So they were you, now apart group, from it. Which group are you referring Christians. to? The, the first or yeah, the those, second group? Yeah, well, the first group here who where it says those who have heard his voice and are now alive as a oh, result yeah. of hearing I, it. I agree with you. Yeah, I was talking about the second group. The, yeah, so the second. The oh, okay. Sorry, I, I thought we were... Sorry, I was hearing no, I, that. I went, I went so. forward. Yeah, I went forward. Sorry. <laughs> All um, good. Yeah. So, anyways, um, any any responses to that? But I just that's kind of what I saw. Was like, okay, it seems to make more sense to me now that those who are in the tombs are the old covenant dead, because even verse twenty nine, like, because they're judged by their deeds. You know, what else would they be judged by? because they, were, they didn't have Christ. So it, it makes more sense that those are the old covenant that, that he's talking about. Because he doesn't say, and the hour is uh, coming and now is. Right? He's, so he's talking about this is coming later. Um, Michael, could I, could I jump in? Or Matt, I'm sorry, Matt. Yeah. Could I jump in on, and with a comment on that? Because the point I want to bring up is right on this exact piece. Um, and I just want to, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not saying that I, I know the answer here, but I just want to offer a, interpretation that, that seems right to me, which is that maybe the, you know, now versus, you know, well, the hour that is now versus the hour that will come is more about the two, two different groups, like the sizes of the groups, like, because now those who hear, you know, are, are coming to life. Clearly, I, I agree with everybody. I think everyone here is agreeing that those were those who were alive in Jesus' day listening to his words and, and believing. But then it says, you know, those who are in the tombs. Um, and I, I just want to bring in like Ezekiel 37 there, like on, on the idea that that someone, I mean, people in their graves must be physically dead. Because I, I don't think, like I think Ezekiel 37 is, is a counterpoint. You know, he says, um, Ezekiel 37, 12, um, or I should start at uh, Ezekiel 37, 11. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy to them and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Right. Then he goes on in verse 13, some more. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will, you know. So, so this is like in the old covenant types, the people were outside of the land, right? They were in Babylonian captivity, and God was saying that he was going to bring them back into their land, and that was going to be a type of a resurrection, right? So I would just offer that, like in John 5, you know, those who are in the tombs, why couldn't that be the same, same sort of a figure where it's, it's also the spiritually dead? But the thing is, like at that last hour, everyone's going to hear it. Christ, the voice of Christ, because that's when the judgment was going to come, and those who who were believing, you know, would would uh, live, but those who were not believing, they would face that that judgment at that time and, and die in the city and in the fires of the city. I just want to offer that as my my interpretation here. Yeah, I it's funny because I actually have that verse written into that verse twenty eight. So I was, I originally, I guess I thought of, I thought that was the connection too. And I can see why you would say that. I guess I just, I kind of see Ezekiel 37 as speaking about not something entirely different from what you're saying, but more along the lines of those who, those who are, uh, um, it's not really talking about those who are in the tombs the same way Jesus is talking about, I guess is what I'm trying to, is what I'm trying to say. That's not, I'm seeing this a little bit differently now. Like those who are in the graves in Ezekiel 37 is really just, in, in my opinion, talking about those who are, um, 
who are, who are in exile. I and agree on, so yeah, I agree on that point. Yeah, and so like this is fulfilled when they come back into the land, but also then when the gospel goes out to the nations. Um, and so when G I just feel like when Jesus is saying those who are in the tombs, um, he's sort of making a distinction between, you know, those who are like cut off, like spiritually, like, like, like in Ezekiel 37, they're sort of, you know, they're cut off because they're in exile, but they're still alive. And he's making a distinction between that and those who are actually dead, you know, um, in so I don't know. That's just how I'm seeing it. But I get I get what you're saying totally because I had that written in as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm just sort of seeing it now for the first time, like a little bit differently. But yeah, I appreciate that's that. That's awesome. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mike. No, Dallas, go ahead. Jump in. I was going to say that's awesome that you're bringing that up because that was the one point that I wanted to focus on because I see it going forward. And this so we talked uh, in one of the previous uh episodes that we did concerning uh on the study in uh where is it first corinthians and i talked about how there was an eschatological timeline piece in there nobody saw it so i didn't make a thing of it and we moved forward but focusing on here i'm going to show how i see the eschatology in first corinthians using the resurrections to be that those points so here we have jesus and this is where i wanted to follow up uh, mike was saying that what is this all circling around? And obviously it's the judgment. That's when the second set here is gonna take place is at a final judgment. So when we read that, what I find interesting is, so truly, truly I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the uh, voice of the son of God and those who hear will live. Well, if we go over to first Corinthians where we've already been and uh, we go down to uh, verse 20, talking about in the the order it 15? says yeah this is uh first corinthians 15 uh verse 20 it says but now christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who are asleep so we're starting to get some context here because that's interesting because it says for since a for the, since by a man came death by a man also came the resurrection of the dead so that brings us all the way back to adam for as an Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Now we're going to start talking about time, timing, in what order? Christ the first fruits, after that, those who are Christ's at his coming. So here you have Christ and the first fruits, Christ and the apostles. So that's the first resurrection. Then what? Then what's the next order? Then it says after that those who are christ's at his coming at his parousia then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to god so to me this is a bit paul is almost quoting john here using that exact same thing but who's he identifying as the dead in the tombs israel the dead ones who are waiting in the sleep all the way back to the promises of don't worry, you know, Jacob, don't worry, Israel, don't worry, you'll sleep, Daniel, you will sleep with your fathers until those tombs are opened. And that's what I see that Corinthians, Paul is paralleling John here for that same message. So yeah. that's how I see it. I appreciate you bringing that up. I did want to say, uh, I appreciate what you said, Simon. Um, First off, you gave me a good proof text to bring to Brian Schwartley about the graves. I mean, I, I know most scholars agree Ezekiel 37 is talking about national restoration of Israel, uh, whether they were physically de dead. I don't think that was the big issue. It was that they were dead in sin and that they were dead in covenant uh, with God. And uh, I'm glad to, I know that a lot of scholars do believe that and have admitted that. So um, it's good to see that the graves is mentioned there. I, I totally missed me. And um, I can bring that up to Brian Shortly as some follow up. Of course, he doesn't allow comments on his video. But, um, you know, uh, th that being said, I appreciate that. And I do. I see like Matt had said, I, I see what you're saying there. I tend to agree more with what we're outlining about the, the you know, the living and then that being about the, those that are actually physically dead. Uh, however, I, I definitely see your point. It's actually it's provoking me. It's an encouraging statement in that if, if I take it the way you're saying it, it would actually be when the times get hard, when that hour comes where there's that great distress and all that mess that's going on, know that that there will be those that will turn to the truth that will live of old covenant Israel. So because, again, it could have seemed very simple 
uh, if you were living in that time, it would have been like, man, we're all, we're, this is bad for all of us. Whereas no, there were those that would have turned to the truth even at the last hour. So uh, yeah, I definitely appreciate what you brought up there. And uh, Dallas, just to respond to what you said there about uh, 1 Corinthians 15, you know, I'm not going to go too much into it, but I used to have a brother that would always show up to church. Uh, Vicky and Edward would know Jack, and Jack used to always bring this verse up. Uh, he had passed away, but, you know, he's, he's resting in peace and in many senses. He a uh, great guy and, you know, had a good heart, so uh, God had his back, I'm sure. So that being said, um, he would bring up this verse, and he would always say, Christ, the first fruits, and then those that were at his coming. And I don't know what he was always getting at. He was, he was somewhat frustrating. He wasn't a preterist. So I, I don't know what he was trying to say to me. And uh, what, I, what I always would break down to him was, well, you know that there are two divergent perspectives. Some folks believe that what it's saying there is Christ, the first fruits, and then those that are his at his coming, which I think is what Jack was trying to argue with me, that, you know, this is all Christ has fulfilled everything, but then at his coming is when everybody else is going to be saved. Um, and then... Uh, then obviously what you brought up, which I tend to, uh, I don't know that I agreed with it then, but I, I see what you're saying about Christ, the first fruits being that first resurrection, and then those that are his at his coming, uh, being that second resurrection, uh, group, the resurrection of the dead. So interesting points just shows that I don't know it all and, uh, gives me opportunity to want to study that a bit further. And I like how that question says that the hermeneutic should be Old covenant promises made the old covenant Israel. That's right. That's, well, that's, you know, uh, if we're saying the resurrection is equivalent to the adoption, which we saw in the book of Romans, then, and Romans says itself, it says the adoption pertains to Israel, uh, which is Israel of the flesh. If you read that chapter there, Romans 9, um, then, yeah, then we have to be reflecting upon the old covenant promises to old covenant Israel. So I appreciate your point there, Edward. Simon, I think a, what do you want to share? Just, just a, um, I, th I think a big aspect here, or maybe, maybe a presupposition that I, I have, um, is like how, how you view like the judgment of the um, unrighteous, like the judgment to condemnation, um, because you know, I, I guess to just to kind of step back and like, you know, of, of some, some views, some, some people view that you know everyone who was dead was raised. Um, in the spirit and, and then stood before uh, God to be to be judged and they either passed or failed and, and then they went to their final eternal destiny whereas others might view it as um, those who died and were under the condemnation of death they weren't they weren't raised again they just stayed dead they were they were gone and dead and gone and, and never had life because they didn't have any life you know, they, were, they were dead but it would actually have been the living at the time of the judgment who would have been facing that judgment of condemnation because they were receiving, you know, the the uh, exact um, uh, payment according to the covenant of, of all the sins of Israel, right? That they were they were experiencing that temporal fiery judgment, and and it kind of touches on your view of, you know, the immortal soul and things like that. Like, is there, you know, when when a when a person is dead physically, um, if they didn't have um, life in Christ, they had no life in God. Do they? Is their spirit somewhere else, <laughs> or, or are they? They're they dead, like literally, just completely gone. Um, so, like, I guess since since I tend towards the view that um, the resurrection of judgment was a was experienced by the living at the return of Christ, that's kind of biasing my view here towards um, you know towards the idea that it's the, the difference isn't the uh, who was alive or who was dead, but but the some versus the all, you know, and, and, and the all would be in the context of who he's talking to, like, you know, all of us here. So, Yeah, I, I totally follow that. I think that's Dr. Don K. Preston would call that a representative judgment. The judgment of the living represented the judgment of all people, uh, you, you know, so I would tend to agree with that. And then I guess there's just some ideas I have in my head. Uh, years ago, I spoke about a conceptual judgment uh, that I think might slightly contrast what Don's saying uh, a little bit with uh, having some something to do with what it meant for the actual physical dead as well. So again, just something I'm continuing to work out. I, uh, but I appreciate what you said there. And I definitely, I understand that perspective. I understand what you're saying. And I don't necessarily, I wouldn't argue against it. I just might see it differently. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the reser like the judgment, I would say though, is the judgment was already on on men, right? If they don't, if they're not in Christ, their stages remain under the judgment. So it's not so the judgment, I, I would distinguish between the judgment and then the doling out of the co of the covenantal curses, which I, I would say the covenantal curses came upon a generation. I, I might I might use the word representative there or, or like that given that you said that I can, could see using that word now. <laughs> but um so someone somewhere I read about Anastasia Anastasia like the standing again of the dead and like that being brought to stand before God um, could could be viewed as as being brought in, brought before God in this temporal judgment. So Israel, you know, coming under the judgment of uh, of God in AD seventy, they were being made to stand before God. And that might have been in one of your books, Michael. I'm not sure. I'll tell you that sounds like you know Don Preston has really done a great job in that area for me. Uh, you know, I've done a little bit of writing about the judgment. I, I did a, a debate actually about the judgment of God. And um, I forget, it was called God's Past Judgment. I have a resource out there. I'll probably dig it up and share it with everyone uh, in our blog for this study. Uh, however, it's, you know, it's something I continue to think about. I try to take in, I know there's, uh, you know, a couple different perspectives of resurrection in the preterist community. And I don't just limit myself to what, you know, my, my teachers say. And, and, you know, I try to take in the totality of what people are saying. And I still have some questions we'll say and, and some you know just ideas that i think maybe need to be responded to because i'm very familiar with uh you know that argument that folks will bring up well wait a minute so you don't believe in the immortal soul so then what stood before god in judgment in ad 70 in regards to the wicked right or what what how did they stand before god and obviously matt brought up those texts earlier in second corinthians and romans 14 uh so then people kind of borrow that so then it does it becomes a interesting dialogue to have and that's where i don't know that i've hammered every uh you know piece that i feel i need to to have a this is what i believe and that's it but rather i kind of welcome in different ideas so i appreciate what you said and i, I really am i'm taking notes and kind of uh, collecting my own thoughts tonight which I'm, I'm sure i could speak for many of us sometimes the real study happens when this study ends you sit there and you just mull through everything we talked about and how that all works so thank you there's a, I can just one last time, and I swear I'll be quiet after this. Like the Romans 14 passage, you know, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That again makes sense in in the paradigm where it's it's a time statement. Actually, it's not a all humans must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But Paul's basically saying, you know, we're the last generation. We have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be there because we know Paul expected to be there, even if he wasn't. We're we're, we're going to be there when this judgment comes. So that that's yeah. my last. Last statement. <laughs> yeah. And that... Because there is a thought that some people believe that, you know, that I don't know or disagree or agree about everyone prior to Jesus Christ, everyone uh, uh, from the time of Moses on or beyond uh, would have to be judged, uh, some, you know, according to the law. Um, but those that were uh, had the opportunity to hear Christ uh, was judged already uh, by the by the uh, uh, by the gospel. They were judged already because, according to uh, uh, John five uh, twenty four, it says, um, "The ones who hear my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and has not come into uh, into judgment." So if you have not believed, you know, you're judged, you're judged already by the gospel, by not believing in Christ Jesus. Um, Amen. I, I think we're, I think we're all in agreement there. I think the question becomes how it pertains to, uh, again, and, and Edward, I don't want to drag it too much here tonight, but what it is, is if the dead, the wicked dead, I'll just kind of throw it your way right now. If the wicked dead you, you just said it out of your mouth, that everyone has to stand before God that lived in the old covenant. Mm -hmm. So then how did they stand before God? If God, does God raise righteous and not unrighteous people and righteous people? Or his, does, as Jesus said, those that raise up are those that are, you know, are in him. And then if you say that they did stand, everyone did stand, how, who, why? Is it concept conceptual? Again, I, I would agree with that. I taught that, uh, but I also know that, you know, that's a, it's an idea. 
it's an idea based on, you know, what I've come to understand through the scriptures, but it's not something that I would sit there and, like I said, you know, being willing to admit I haven't uh, kind of hammered out my view the way that I feel, uh, because I get in on these discussions with folks, so I know that there are some questions there, and even myself, I don't have, you know, verse after verse to kind of throw at people. Uh, I need you folks to join me in those conversations, and maybe we would have it all hammered out. Um, but again, I, I just want to explain, Edward, that the, what we're saying tonight is, we were admitting that 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 challenge that if all people stand before the judgment seat, we then have to answer in what form, like, you know, what what's raising up and actually standing before God? Is it a soul? Is it a spirit? Is it a physical body? Is it, you know, what is it? So, and I think I may have cut Matt off for someone. So Matt, if I did, please jump in. Oh, I was just going to say, Simon was highlighting what I was saying about Romans 14, that it's, you know, those alive at that time, or, you know, Paul is saying, uh, we have to give an account, but I'm saying, how it, how does that correlate? How does that um, uh, how does that go together with John five twenty four, who's when Jesus says they don't come into judgment, unless the judgment just simply means, um, you know, like the the judgment of the wicked, and then yeah, and then so and so then so those who come who give an account are not being judged in that way, but I don't know. <laughs> They're just there at the judgment, right? They they have to pass. They have to pass through that judgment. Temporally uh -huh. speaking, the people who who live through AD seventy, especially if they were in Judea, they had to like get through that judgment, right? Now, if they fled. Oh, you're saying that they will all experience the judgment, but not yeah, like in a, not be in, a in a spiritual way. <laughs> That's I, what, I I get what you're saying. saying. Okay. So then are we saying that there is no spirit that be, that becomes resurrected? Like when Jesus says that those who come forth from the tombs um, are judged by their deeds. And then, which is similar to what Paul says in Acts. Uh, are we saying that there is no spirit that is, for those people that, like how, like you, Mike, you were saying, in what form is this happening? I mean, that, that's definitely a view that I, that I read and one that I, I lean towards, but Kind of like Mike was saying, I wouldn't die on this hill, but um, my understanding yeah. would be that the that there is no no there wouldn't be a resurrection of the wicked physically dead. Their spirit would never get raised, but the spiritually dead who are alive at the judgment would stand before God and be judged. Um, God would judge those them there. The, the dead were already dead; they already received the wages of sin, which is death, and they were, they just remain under judgment, sort of like John three sixteen seventeen says. Um, or has not believed is already under the judgment of God, or forget the judgment of God persists. Right. That, that's a, that's a view. Um, you know, other people have the view that the spirits do raise again and, and stand, and then get sent off into the lake of fire, and and, and still have yeah. a violation of view. So I, I guess I'm asking, like, for those who who are saying who believe that those are who are in the tombs that Jesus is referring to are the old covenant physically dead. For those that believe that. In what form are they coming forth? That's the question. I would tend to say that I would uh, agree with Edward and I, I guess Mike that what we're watching in that portion is it, it's a court trial. And so it's a picture so that we understand what is taking place in the invisible world so that we can now live in the new manifest reality. So it's not that these things are literally actually taking place. It's just spoken in terms of law because we're watching the end of a legal system come to the end. So we're speaking of law terms about the passing of the one into the other. So that's all. I, I just think we can take it really far. But it's just a picture of this is what happened, guys. Don't worry about them. Or as Paul's being challenged, well, what's going to happen to them? Oh, don't worry, guys. They'll be with us. I think it's just a way of expressing that concept of, well, what's going to happen to the dead? Mm -hmm. And since yeah. we're talking about a legal system, a lawsuit against Israel, like Hosea said, I have a case against Israel. So that to me, that's, it's a picture. There's no other way to say it. They're trying to describe the undescribable. Amen. So, uh, so I guess just to make it really, really simple, are you saying that there is life after death in some way or no? Yes. Well, for those that have covenant life, the covenant life continues. Blessed are those who die in the Lord forever. 
uh, uh, Revelation chapter 14. So yes, now in what fashion, what form would I be comfortable calling it spirit, soul, new, new genus, I think is a phrase I heard recently. No, I would not be comfortable with that. Um, what, but what I would be comfortable with is saying that it exists. Now for those that are not, uh, that do not have spiritual life, uh, that's what I think Simon's leaning in on there. Uh, those folks know, I think that they're already in their identity, which is death. Uh, they don't need to be, uh, we're raised in Christ. Like, all right, so uh, I'll say this publicly. I think I've taught this here and there. Uh, in my home, I teach that if I'm in Christ, I don't die. So now if you imagine, I'm raising a five-year-old. So uh, that, that question can be confusing. It's like, well, that's going to be confusing in the future. But Jesus said it, I don't die. And I think what ends up having to happen is we have to redefine the way that we've been taught westernly uh, about death, what it, that means, what actually happens when my biological existence ceases. Uh, does that mean I died? Or does that mean that I have continued somewhere else? You know, I think these are mature questions that actually need to be brought up in the body of Christ, especially among the preterist community. Um, and I don't know that they've been, you know, I'll say, uh, Matt, just to kind of respond a bit here. Uh, I'm familiar with three major views that I know within the preterist community. There's the idea that uh, we have conceptual relationship. It's a, basically, this is all about covenant relationship with God. What it means in the unseen is not given to us in scripture. That's yeah. you, know, you, I would probably hold to there. This is all about my identity with God, that I have a living identity, a new identity, a spiritual identity with Christ that is not dependent upon the flesh, if you will, or I don't even like to use that, but um, not dependent upon myself. Um, whereas then there's the immortal body at death view, uh, which, you know, Ed Stevens pretty much holds to the uh, traditional futurist idea of, you know, judgment seed, and you're going to be raised in some sort of form, which he calls spiritual or glorified. Uh, and then the third view, which I heard this week, uh, which I guess is gaining some momentum, is that we become a new genus, that this is actually talking about, yes, we will become spirit beings. We are, we are spirit beings on the earth. Uh, and that's what this is all about. Now, for me, that runs against what I read in the Old Testament. I don't know that that was the hope, uh, but that's what some folks are saying. So, and I think they have an idea that, yes, we would be a spirit being that continues in heaven forever. For me, I believe that Christians do continue forever. Uh, those that have Christ, whether they call themselves Christians or not, I want to be careful there, um, that uh, we continue with God and we have a blessed identity and relationship with God forever what that looks like i have no idea okay uh, that's satisfactory to me because i you know i'm learning this this you know I'm, I'm learning to see all of this and i'm sorry to take up so much time especially being late but uh, this is just a big uh you know uh, still trying to sort of formulate this for, you know okay. like what this looks like after this life and i and i certainly am coming to more of an understanding of the covenantal picture of that and i think that is very important. It makes a lot of sense, but I do still think that in some way, shape or form, if there isn't a consciousness at all, you know what I mean? Like afterwards, what's the, what's the point? I mean, uh, to me, and to me, at least that's just how I think, like, what is the point? It's kind of like what Paul says, you know, like if, if the dead aren't raised, then, then who cares um, whether he's saying yeah, that agree. exactly or not, but that's, so that's why I'm kind of thinking like, you know, and and I like the way you said, you know, I don't, I don't also, I also don't know what it looks like. And I'm, I'm fine with that. I just want, I guess I'm just kind of asking like, you know, is there something? And it sounds like you're saying, yes, there is, you know, but. Matt, Matt I should be much more careful when I, when I threw out the phrase immortal soul or believing, I should be much more careful because the first time I was ex exposed to that, which was after I became a preterist, I went away from like hearing that, hearing that talk about thinking these people don't believe in any life after death at all. So, yeah. like, when I, I believe that immortality is conditional, that it comes to light in Christ, so that if we have Christ, we have immortality, that we'll never die, that we'll go on living with God somehow, somewhere. Um, but if, but the immortal soul says that, um, like the Westminster Confession says, if you're going like that, that every soul that God ever created in a human being is going to live eternally, either in heaven or in hell. Right, right. That, that I don't hold to anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I hold to conditional immortality where, if you're in Christ, you have eternal life after, after this physical life is over. So I, I should, I should have, uh, I give, given what I went through when I first heard that, you know, idea put out, I should be more careful. When I, oh no. Yeah, no, there was, 
<laughs> no, no fault of anyone. I, I just, I've actually brought this question up before. It's just sometimes when we go over these things, it, it start, it starts to sound a little bit like it's only covenantal. And I'm just wondering, what does that mean after, uh, afterwards? You know, that's all. That's neat stuff because you're bringing it back to covenantal because I wanted to speak to what Simon was talking about as well, because it rounded out a little bit of where I was going to take it anyway. Because I'm of the position that the judgment was only for those under covenant. Because how can you be judged by a covenant you weren't ever a part of? Sure. So that's that a pretty sense. big legal jargon, right? Like, But it, it is. It's common thinking. So if we take a look at that, to me, when we take a look at the judgment, and that's obviously what we're talking about with resurrection, because it all takes place with the judgment. Well, the judgment was talking about that body of Adam from Adam, Abel, Cain, all the way up through Israel. So that body was under judgment. Why? Because they had an agreement that if we did these things, then we would either get the curse or we would get the blessing. So they were literally under judgment about whether or not they live in those stratas. But when that came to an end, Jesus now has perpetual blessing. So that's where life is. So when I take a look at the old, when they went to death, they had to be put into a, you know, a holding tank, so to speak, for a final judgment that is going to divide all those who did live up to the expectations and those who didn't. And we saw, like, with, especially with Abraham, how his uh, uh, faith was credited to, credited to him, but he needed to wait around for the realization of it. So we have this whole system holding back all these people who were trying to live up to the faith. But at the exact same time, a whole bunch of people who just didn't care to. And so that we had those two groups of people and they had to sit and wait until the end of the covenant contract agreement. But now we're in a new covenant contract agreement. All those people that were out of the covenant contract agreement, they had their second death. They just weren't raised again. I'm of that position as well. Those who were in the blessings, they then were part, they were now just brought into the kingdom of christ which brings us to an interesting position today where because i believe then that the lake of fire and the second death was talking about israel i don't see judgment for anyone today today is what you just finished saying simon at the point of your reckoning you are either in christ and you go to be with god in whatever manner that ends up being because the bible is pretty vague upon it or you just instantly go to disappear. That's it. Consciousness ceases. I so agree. I agree with that. Yeah. That yeah. Is, so that's where I'm kind of balancing all that kind of stuff. Okay. Thank you. That's why I'd be covenantal. Sorry, Edward. I just to finish the thought there. So to me, it is a hundred percent covenantal. Today, there's only one condition to get into the covenant with Jesus to be with God, and that is either submit to His throne or not. That's it. So okay. it's that it's, makes that you makes get sense. What, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's that still covenantal, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe that. I believe that too. So yeah, thanks for fleshing that out. And sorry for taking up so much time. <laughs> no, I'm glad you went there because that's where I was going anyway. So it was cool. <laughs> awesome. Sorry, Edward. I, I just wanted to finish that thought. Yes, Matthew 10, 28 reads, and do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Um, so basically the, the soul is not, in, is not immortal. It can die. What gives it immortality is Jesus Christ. That's if you want to go there. Um, Amen. That's basically what I wanted to share in that regard. Amen. Yeah, obviously uh, that conversation brings us into another conversation, uh, which then becomes, you know, what is a soul? Uh, and then you, do we believe in tripartite, bipartite man and conversations that, in my uh, estimation, are nauseating. So, uh, uh, you know, again, I, I, uh, I do think that's a good study for another time, though, but just a personal thought. Um, I do thank you all for the thoughts tonight, you know, and I, that was the heart at the beginning of our study, not to be folks that have all the answers, but rather that we, we have some foundational truths here. We have things that this text is not saying, just plain and simple. There's things this text is not saying. If you didn't catch that tonight, I will make sure I write up and share my notes. I encourage you to go back and look. There's things, this is not projected to the future. This is not some judgment that we're all waiting to see. Uh, this is, uh, you know, and there are time texts and very clear prophetic 
allusions that are found in John 5 that need to be understood before we just start jumping into John 5 and allowing our friend from down the road tell us what they think this text means. Uh, so, you know, and I say that kindly because I have a friend that is the friend down the road that's been telling me what he thinks out of John 5. Get into the Old Testament. Uh, that's what we have to do here. So, um, you know, uh, I hope that we've relayed that tonight. But then again, on the flip side of that, there's some things I know, and there's plenty of things that I don't know. And I think that we can all say we don't know that we're still working through and, uh, you know, and, and maybe finding better ways to explain things. I know that's sort of my, uh, my heart is that I sometimes I have it here, I just can't get it out. And, uh, you know, and I, I'm always working on that. So I want to encourage all of us to be doing that. Because I appreciate your minds and your hearts, and you're influencing more people than you know. So Mike, you. before you shut this down, I just on behalf of everybody again, thank you for providing us a platform to be able to work these things out. Because of what you just said, I think too, there's a lot of stuff that you don't even know you contain. But then uh, someone will present an idea or a question. And then in the midst of this fellowship, there's truths that come out of you you don't even know are alive in you. So thank you for giving us a platform to fellowship and make these things take place. Well, praise God. Well, thank you for making it a blessing. I appreciate that. And uh, I thank you all for being here. Uh, I do thank you again. I appreciate the insight. I know I'll be going back and looking at this video and, and seeing some things that you know need to be further studied out. And, uh, you know, God willing, as we conclude this study, we'll double back and, and build up more studies. Uh, so uh, thank you again. Uh, I hope tonight, if I may just double back on one thought, um, I want to encourage you, go to mianogonewild.wordpress.com. Uh, I'm going to have a whole bunch of resources and all my notes that I shared tonight uh, to share with you. Uh, I appreciate what Mike Sullivan did. I really do. And I want to I encourage you, go to his blog site, vi visit that blog that I'll share. Uh, and go through much, much of his work. But the five points that he made tonight, uh, I think really hit the head on the, I can't get it right, uh, hit the head, the hammer, the nail, whatever, <laughs> on the head, you get it. <laughs> what is it, Edward? Hit the nail on the head. There you go. Thank you, brother. Um, appreciate that. And he, he really did. He did a great job. So um, I'll provide the link, but just consider these five things. The resurrection in the immediate context is spiritual. If you believe in me, you've passed out of death into life. You've passed out of judgment into eternal life. This is a spiritual reality that Christ is offering to the people that believe in him. Number two, the eschatological not yet coming hour of John 4 is AD 70. That would be what would make it clear that they wouldn't worship on this mountain or that mountain. Number three, the resurrection of Daniel 12, 2 through 3 was fulfilled in AD 70. Jesus is referencing that in John 5, verses 28 through 29. Jesus elsewhere teaches, number four, Jesus elsewhere teaches that the resurrection of Daniel 12 would be fulfilled at the end of the old covenant age, Matthew chapter 13 and chapter 24. And number five, John's eschatological last hour in 1 John 2, 17 through 18, and the hour of judging the dead in Revelation 14, 7 was fulfilled in AD 70. I look forward to studying further with you. We're going to stay in the book of John. So next Tuesday, we will be in John chapter 11, I believe. We're either going to be in John 6 or John 11, somewhere over there. So keep reading through John. Keep uh, considering the truths that are here. And I look forward to uh, gathering together, worshiping God, because that's what this is uh, with each of you uh, next Tuesday night. Thank you for being here. And Edward, if you don't mind, I'm going to unmute you. Can you close us in a word of prayer? Sure. Heavenly Father, thank you for going before us and giving us uh, further understanding, questions, uh, iron sharpening iron with uh, those that are here with us live, those in the uh, uh, social media uh, community. Um, I thank you and it's been a blessing. And I pray, I pray that, you know, that it will continue at this level of, of joy and understanding and learning of you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. God bless.